Welcome everyone on behalf of Dallas College and the sustainability team. My name is Faye Davis and I am joined by my team member uh, Sonia Ford um, and Neil Kaufman who are working in the background. We are also grateful for the support of the Dallas College WebEx support team. Um, so without further ado, I want to give them as much time as we can. Um, I'd like to introduce your speaker, Michael Blell. Uh, Michael Blell is an organic vegetable farmer here in Dallas, Texas. He owns and operates the Dallas Half Acre Farms, which is located a mile south of Beltline off of I-20. He calls his type of farmi farming market gardening. It's also known as spin farming, and some also call it urban farming. This year will be his sixth, sixth season farming part-time and teaching elementary PE full-time in Mesquite. He grows mainly seasonal vegetables with an emphasis on year-round salad mixes. Thank you so much, Michael, for joining us. Um, please take it away. All right, well, I appreciate y'all having me today. Uh, I'm excited to speak with everyone. Like you said, my name is Michael Bell. I own Dallas Half Acre Farm here in Dallas. Um, and also, like she said, there's a lot of different names you can call this. Um, like she said, some people call it farming, some people call it market gardening, uh, spin farming. Uh, it's uh, getting very popular for a lot of reasons, which I hope to explain to y'all today. And um, we will get started. So who is Dallas Half Acre Farm? And don't worry guys, I'm not gonna read. There's just a couple of slides here that I'm gonna read from. And then after that, it'll just be mainly talking. So I won't bore you with a bunch of reading, I promise. Um, my farm was created to produce the highest quality of vegetables possible using organic methods with an emphasis on regenerative no-till soil management practices. And that sounds really fancy, but it's not. Um, I'll explain it in a little bit exactly what that means. As it evolves, it's, it is becoming an on-site learning farm in hopes of not only producing great tasting, healthy vegetables, but also the next generation of small-scale farmers through internships. And that last sentence um, kind of over time has become almost as important to me as um, growing vegetables. I've really found a passion for getting other people started in this type of farming um, for a lot of reasons, which we'll discuss. But this is definitely more than just a vegetable farm, in my opinion. So what is no-till? Most people don't understand what that, what, what that means when it comes to farming. No-till no farming is, a, is an ag technique for growing crops or pastures without disturbing the soil through tillage. So tillage is everything from a uh, John Deere tractor pulling a plow to your backyard gardening uh, technique, just using a tillage every, you know, a tiller every summer or spring to till up your soil to start your farm. I don't do that. And um, I could spend a whole episode on why no till is so advantageous to a farmer or a gardener, but I won't, we'll move on from there. Just to give you an idea though, it, it, it is very important for a lot of reasons. Uh, everyone's concerned with climate change and all of that. And to give you just a little bit of reference, tillage in the United States from farming, you know, mainly through the Midwest, puts more CO2 into the air every year than the automo automobiles do in America. So real quick, if you think about it, when you till, you're tilling up the soil, which has carbon in it. Carbon is very important to soil management. And when you till it, you release that CO2 back into the air, which is not good. We wanna take CO2 from the air and put it into the ground. Uh, there's a great video um, and anything that I reference today that's not on the slide, you are free to email me or get a hold of me and I will send to you. Uh, but there's a great video on YouTube from Ray Archuleta, who is a soil scientist. And it goes through uh, a time-lapse video of the atmosphere over the world. And it, it lights up in different colors and the color red represents CO2. And every spring starting in April and May, the red just blows up over the Midwest. And I couldn't figure out what it was until I heard him present the whole thing. And that's actually when the farmers start plowing the fields to get their corn, soybean, you know, everything else into the ground. And that red represents the CO2 coming out of the ground. So 
it's just obvious at that point what tillage does to the soil and and plus it's very destructive to healthy soil so that is a very brief description of what and why no no till is very important um the other part of that first slide uh why is small scale regenerative urban farming important small scale allows you to pivot very quickly um i've pivoted changed directions with my farm several times already in six years and because it's small um, and the way i farm i can change directions with what i'm growing in a matter of weeks whereas most large-scale farmers it takes them years or at least one year if not many more to change directions and go from one crop to another or even one entire system to another it's also a very low startup cost um, i've had one one former intern that started farming with one 50 foot bed, which I'll describe, you'll see in a few minutes, one 50 foot bed. And now she's got nine hundred and nine, 150 foot beds that she's farming and doing very well. So it's a very, very low startup cost. I mean, you can start with almost the cost of seeds. Uh, it, it also allows you to expand slowly or as quickly as you want. And then finally, there's a, there's a famous quote, and I mistyped it on this uh, PowerPoint, so I apologize for that, by a guy named Gabe Brown. And it says, and he always says, why do you want to sustain a degraded resource? And our soil across the United States is already degraded from 100 years of using farming techniques that just don't work for the long term, such as tillage, monocropping, and things like that. So um you you don't want to sustain a degraded resource you want to regenerate that resource so that's why you know in my little presentation it says regenerative farming i want to improve my soil every single year i don't want to sustain it i want to regenerate it i want to make it better for the next season and finally the the urban farming urban local is everything in food nutrition uh you know taste you can tell the difference in locally grown food in a tomato that you eat out of your backyard and one that you buy at the grocery store, uh, you know, from California. And again, I can spend an hour talking about the differences, but just know that urban and local farming and gardening, whatever you want to call it, is so much healthier for you because we allow the fruit to ripen on the vine, for example, like the tomato. Most tomatoes that are picked that you buy in the grocery store were actually picked when they were green. And then they ripen on the way to the, to the grocery store and then in the back of the store and then on the shelf. So, and there's scientific evidence that 90% of the nutrition of a tomato comes the last three to four days before it's harvested on the vine. That's why they're so much sweeter is because they get ripened on the vine. They take those sugars, and, and everything happens like it's supposed to on a vine. Whereas you pick a green tomato in California, Florida, Mexico, you ship it up here and it turns red on the, on the shipment. And that's just not optimal for taste or nutrition. Uh, so I always get asked, how do you get started? So like in my farm says, it's a half acre farm. This is a quick couple of pictures uh, the picture with the billboard sign is how I got how I always get started. If I'm going to get a new piece of land or piece of property going, I have billboard signs that I bought for fifty dollars off of Craigslist. There's a sign, billboard sign company that sells old billboard signs. They use them for pond liners to cover hay. I use them to start farms. Um, I lay them down, whatever I can find. You know, I got old two by sixes, a concrete. Uh, pillar there holding the sign down what you do is you mow it you scalp it as close as you can to the ground and then you put this sign on it and what that sign does is it keeps the sun off of it which no sunlight plants die now it does take a while during the winter you know if you're going to do it over the winter you want to throw it down october november and then you got to leave it till march but if you will do that and if you're patient you pull that sign off and it is the prettiest most perfect soil that you can imagine to start with 
all that grass that was on top, it has decayed and, and become good hummus. And it, it's just perfect to plant into. You have a clean slate. So the picture on your on your on the other side of the screen there, that is a row of peas that is in the same spot that the billboard sign was. That's the first time that place got planted six months later. And I always throw down mulch um, and then just planted a row of peas. We've got another row of peas that I think I, that are about to come up. And the metal uh, hoops there, that's for some plastic that I put over it because this was taken in March and we're supposed to get a pretty cold spell. So I can just throw some plastic over those hoops and it will keep things from freezing and dying you know, during the cold nights and then just take it off during the day. So that's a very, very brief uh, description on how a person can get started. Uh, it's, it sounds crazy, but I promise you it works. I've got all my land has been cleared using billboard signs, just like this. Uh, this is the inside of one of my tunnels. I have three of these tunnels. They're called caterpillar tunnels. They are 14 feet wide and they can be as long as 130 feet and they can be as short as you know, whatever you wanna make it. Uh, if you buy them, the shortest they come is 50 foot. And all they do is keep, it, give, it gives you a small space to keep covered in the, in the cold. Uh, it keeps things dry, which if you grow lettuce, which I, I tend to grow a lot of lettuce and leafy greens, the rain doesn't hurt the lettuce. What hurts the lettuce is the humidity. So like, for example, right now, if I was farming without the plastic on and it come a quick shower, you know, and I have a full head of lettuce, like you see in the pictures, moisture is going to get down in those leaves. And then that storm's going to go away. It's going to be four o'clock and it's going to be 110 degrees, you know, heat index probably. And I'm going to get a fungus and it's going to kill every one of those lettuce plants. And I've just lost an entire crop. So farming under the plastic, like I do, it keeps everything dry. I control pretty much everything. I use uh, drip irrigation. So the leaves never really get wet. If they do, you know, it's wind blown, rain blowing in or whatever. So it's not that big of a deal because that'll dry. But it's that hard pounding that gets down deep inside those full heads of lettuce that will give it a fungus that, you know, it'll, it'll just destroy your crop. Um, I only grow, I will say I only grow. I mostly grow under tunnels like okra. I don't grow under tunnels because that stuff's pretty much, you can't kill that stuff unless you chop it. Um, and then I'll grow some beans and peas outside of the tunnels during the middle of the summer. But most part, everything grows under the tunnels. Uh, over there on the side, it says interplanting. So being on a small scale like I am, I only have a half acre, which doesn't sound like much, but if you, Figure out the techniques such as interplanting. You can really grow a lot of food in a small spot. These beds are 36 inches wide. Um, so it's 36 inches wide, and then they can be any length you want them to. So I transplant my lettuce into the ground, usually on day 21. I start my lettuce in seed trays, and 21 to 24 days later after starting the seed, I transplant them out into the, into the ground. And you plant them six inches apart. And if you will go in and the same day that you transplant lettuce, you can transplant a row, I'm not, I'm sorry, not transplant. You can plant a row of radishes in between that lettuce. And about the time that your lettuce is starting to get big and start touching each other, those radishes will be ready to harvest. You can see in the picture on the close up, you can actually see the red radishes popping up out of the ground. And then so you can pull those and your lettuce can finish growing with no problem. Harvest the lettuce. I've got onions on the outside of the lettuce just for more production. There's a lot of things you can do as far as like interplanting to maximize space. Uh, tomatoes, I grow tomatoes down the middle of my tunnel. So I'm sorry, down the middle of my middle bed. So I can plant lettuce. On the sides of the on the sides of the tomatoes, and the tomato shades the lettuce during the heat of the summer. I've grown beets, I've grown radishes, I've grown onions, I've grown carrots, I've grown all of those things next to tomatoes because tomatoes grow up and they don't get big and bushy, or at least the ones that I grow tend to get tall and not quite as bushy. 
So inner planning you can do with, you know, with just any amount of space, even a backyard garden, it's, it's great to do. If you've got an open spot, you know, radishes are a great thing to interplant. It takes 21 days. And, you know, interplanting uh, radishes is, is, like I said, good. Beets are really good. Uh, onions are really good. You can interplant anything if you just imagine the size of the crop that's going to be when the when the first crop gets bigger. So hopefully that made sense. Uh, I've even seen people interplant cantaloupe underneath tomatoes because cantaloupe stay close to the ground. Cucumbers you can do. So that just gives you an idea of how I maximize my production. So this is a video of my lettuce. This, this is what lettuce looks like most of the time. Right now it's struggling because of the heat. Uh, I do grow lettuce. I try to grow lettuce year round. Uh, there's certain varieties that do very well in the heat with a little bit of shade cloth. Uh, this was taken back in April though, so I don't have the shade cloth on yet. Uh, if you want those varieties to try, shoot me an email, or if you've got something to write down, they're called Salanova, S-A-L-A-N-O-V-A. -A -A. Uh, there's three or four, or actually there's eight different varieties of Salanova that you can grow. I grow two. And then there's red Cherokee variety, which is that red on the right-hand side. And then that light green in the middle is called Mir, M-U-I-R. And you can get all of them at Johnny's Seeds if you're interested in growing those. But this is just a video, a quick video of, of the lettuce. It, it's really pretty. Uh, the only really insects that you have that attack your lettuce is the moths lay their eggs in there. And then you have uh, worms that will eat the lettuce. So you sometimes you have to do uh, insect netting over the top, or if you just have a few heads you're going for your backyard, just check them every day during the spring and the fall, and you can pick the little worms off. Um, I do not use any insecticides at all um, or pesticides. I don't use uh, any type of fertilizer. Um, I'll get to that in a, in a few minutes. And then... What's great about this lettuce that I grow is called cut and come again. And when most people think of cut and come again that do garden and understand that phrase, they think they pick one or two leaves off of the, the side of the plant and then they wait and they come back the next day and pick two more. This stuff is actually, you cut the whole head off of it and then that head regrows. So you actually get two during two cuttings during the summer and maybe three during the fall and spring when it's not quite as stressed. And this is the way I harvest it. I have lights that run uh, through all of my tunnels that I connect to my solar system. Uh, I do not have electricity on my farm and I do not have running water on my farm. So um, I use a little solar unit that I built that I learned how to do off of YouTube from everything from Harbor Freight. And since I teach full time here in Mesquite, I usually go to the farm about 4.30 in the morning and do what I need to do during the school year, usually harvesting, and then go to school. At my lunch period, I'll package up the produce and get it delivered after school and then go by the farm and do what I need to do. So that's why it's pitch black. It's probably five o'clock in the morning in this video. But this is just an idea of how I harvest it. You just reach down, you wrap your hand around the whole head, take your razor blade, you cut it off right above the, a little bit above, about an inch above the ground, check it, take the bad leaves off, you know, kind of just give it a quick glance, make sure there's no bugs in it, drop it down, and go on to the next one. Reach your hand around it, cut the whole thing off, check it, throw it in the bucket. So it, it's really easy to harvest. Um, if you're not harvesting, you know, 100 or 150 heads, it doesn't take long at all. I can usually harvest three or four heads a minute. So it doesn't take a, a long time. Uh, to give you an idea, I sell salad mix for $5 a bag. It's a one gallon Ziploc bag. It's about 10 ounces. So it's not too much more expensive than what you buy like Whole Foods but it'll last two weeks in your refrigerator. And the reason why it'll last two weeks is 
A, I harvest it and sell it to you, get it to you the same day. So it's as fresh as possible. And B, I don't clean it. Like I don't wash it and do all of that. So uh, it doesn't get wet. And that's the key to keeping salad fresh. Uh, if you've ever opened up, you know, a plastic tub from Whole Foods and reached down and then the bottom of it slimy, it's because it has moisture in it. It's not because the lettuce went bad. It's because the moisture in it has built up and gotten made everything slimy. My stuff will turn brown before it'll get slimy because there's no moisture in the bag. Um, so people appreciate that. I've had I've had customers text me and say, I just found my bag from last week that I got shoved in the back and I thought my husband ate it all, but he didn't. It just got pushed in the back and it's just as fresh as the day I bought it. So it, I, I take great pride in those kind of text messages, knowing that they can eat 7, 10, 12 day old lettuce and it still be as fresh as the day they got it. And like I said, I sell it for $5 a bag. Just to give you a reference, if anyone out there is thinking money, it takes about seven heads to equal one bag of salad. So seven heads of lettuce equals $5. So that kind of gives you an idea on the, on the, the money. So people that I talk to that talk about getting into this uh, type of farming, like, well, who am I gonna sell it to? And I tell people all the time, this is the easiest sell you will ever the easiest product you'll ever sell. I can guarantee it. Um, I always sell to teachers in my school district because I know all of them. Most of the schools are pretty local. I have a good relationship with them. Like it's just, it just works out with my schedule. But this summer I expanded my farm a little bit and I was looking for more customers and I live out in Forney. And a lot of the teachers that I, that I sell to, they don't live in Mesquite. They live in Dallas or Richardson or Garland. And I don't want to drive all over Dallas for a you know, 15, $20 basket with gas being $5 a gallon. So I made this post. Um, Y'all can read it. It's in a, a Facebook group page called This Is Forney. And the, the first paragraph is my edited part. I had to go back because I had so many responses. If you look down there on the pictures, this was my exact post with the pictures. I had 202 comments and 290 likes. And after three days, I had to take the post down. I had to delete the post because it was just, people wouldn't quit calling me. They wouldn't quit you know, sending me direct messages on Facebook. I, I had two ladies that were crying because they were so excited. Obviously they got pushed to the front of the list because anybody that cries over produce is pretty passionate about it. So they had stories, you know, that, that reason why they wanted fresh organic produce that they could trust. So I bumped them up to the front of the list, but the response was absolutely insane guys. And I was hoping to get five or six new customers, to be honest with you. And I made a, I call it a waiting list. It was more for my ego because I just wanted to count and see how many people they that I actually could sell to. And I had 130 people and, you know, sign up or want to sign up. So I put them on a list and I said, if I have extra, I'll contact you. And that just blew me away that I could sell 130 different families produce and probably more than that if I would have left the post up. So if you ever consider doing this and which I'm a huge advocate of, I will help anyone out there that wants to get started, that thinks they want to get started, small scale, if you want to be huge, whatever you want to do, I will help you. Please contact me. Um, but the last thing you need to worry about is supply and demand. Well, you got to worry about supply, but do not worry about demand because you can sell all of it that you want. And the, just a quick comment about this picture. These are just a couple of the things that I grow. This was an early spring basket um, around the end of March, March 25th. Um, the salad mix is up there in the top. I have a 15 laying hens, so I usually sell eggs in the bath. I call it a basket. Um, the salad mix, the eggs, kale, spring onions, and radishes. And that was a $20 basket. Uh, actually, there were some carrots in there too, and I forgot to put them in the picture. So they actually got carrots also. And I call it a basket 
it usually goes in a gets delivered in a Kroger bag. And I just hand it to them at the door, leave it on their door, and they then mow me the money or they leave me a 20 under the doormat. So it's very, um, what's the word? Not professional at the way I do some of the stuff, but it's it works. Customers are happy, I get paid. And so it just works for my context. And I haven't had anyone, you know, complain about anything. If there's ever a problem, if the you know radishes don't taste right or the salad mix isn't good or whatever, I never ask questions. I either offer to give them their money back or take them some new stuff or give it to them free the next time. Um, it, it's not where I'm not going to lose a customer because somebody thought the radishes were pilfy or the salad mix was bitter. It, it's not worth it to me. So I don't ever argue. I did have one person try to do it about three weeks in a row. And so I just didn't call to deliver to her anymore. I don't thought she was taking advantage of it. So never caused a big stink. Just quit calling her to deliver her stuff. So resources. Um, these are the three books that I highly, highly recommend to anyone. Uh, the Urban Farmer by Curtis Stone. Uh, he is kind of like the godfather of modern day urban farming. And he got that title because he started YouTubing back in, I don't know, 2013, maybe 2014. And he vlogged every single day for 365 days other than maybe a few Sundays. And he owns a farm or you did own a farm up in Canada. And it's the, uh, I can't remember the, which Providence it is, but it's right above like Idaho, Wyoming, stretch of America so it's very dry and it doesn't get quite as cold as you would think in Canada so he farms 10 months out of the year out of his backyard as you can tell from the bottom picture of his book he farms out of his backyard and then he also has three or four neighbor's yards that he farms and he makes 125 to 150 thousand dollars a year and he has, you know, he, he's perfectly open about it. And he was having such great success that he started YouTubing, trying to get people to do, you know, the same thing, teaching people very detailed stuff about each crop he does, how he does things, why he does things, what's working, what's not. Um, he uses very little uh, tools. You know, everything is pretty much by the hand or by a tool that doesn't run off of gasoline. So it's a very cheap startup cost. So if you're thinking about it or you just want to watch something that's really pretty on YouTube, as far as gardening goes, look up The Urban Farmer by Curtis Stone. And then the second one, the middle guy is uh, John uh, Martin Fortier. He does the same thing that Curtis does. Uh, his book's kind of the same just goes into you know, more detail, different, different details, but the same philosophy is still the same thing. So he, uh, quick story about him. He was actually approached a few years ago by a billionaire in Canada. And he was asked if he would build, help him build the largest market garden known in the world. And through all these different conversations or whatever, he agreed to it. So he runs a 10 acre market garden in Canada that produces over a million dollars a year in sales. And there's no gasoline powered tools. Everything's pretty much hand done, except for some cedars that he has. And he pretty much proved that he could uh, scale up what Curtis was doing and what he had done on his own farm. And it's just a amazing uh, accomplishment. He, he employs 12 people. I think he has 12 people and then he has three or four interns that he brings in every year. But it's just a, a fascinating project that he did. So, and he also has a YouTube channel. It's not quite as in-depth as uh, Curtis's, but it's, it's, a, it's a good channel. You can learn a lot. And then finally, the, the book on the right, um, it's not so much about gardening or farming. It's more about ranching. But the guy down there, the, the, the title, Gabe Brown, he's the guy that I referenced in my opening slide. It is um, 
a great read if you're a nerd about soil and soil health and climate. Uh, it gets a lot into the climate aspects of farming and how cows are not the problem. It's the way we raise them, which I 1000% agree. Uh, feedlot cattle is a huge uh, environmental problem. Cattle out eating grass actually helps the actually helps the uh, environment. You know, like they, the cows eat the grass, the grass regrows, brings in more photosynthesis, brings in more CO2 and puts it in the ground where it belongs. And he's, he's kind of famous for saying um, his, cattle's, his cattle live a great life. They have the greatest life ever. They just have one bad day. And you know, that's, that's pretty much true. So those are the three books that I highly recommend if anyone's interested in this kind of stuff. In the back of both uh, the Market Gardener and the Urban Farmer, they both have very detailed um, uh, sections on each plant. So like he tells you how to plant spinach, how many rows per 30 inch bed, how far your spacing should be on certain crops. And it's very detailed. It, it, I still, I've been doing this six years now and I still refer to both of these books once or twice a week just to make sure what I'm doing is right or you know, maybe get a different idea. Um, so th that's the end of the slide. I'm gonna uh, talk one minute about my business that I don't have slides on. But um, so the main goal for me doing this was A, to introduce a new type of farming to people that might wanna farm, but don't realize that they can in their backyard. Like you can start as small as you want. And the second one is I'm actually trying to get more people to do this. Um, I, I want to see a hundred of my farms go up in Dallas. And if you sit there and think, oh, a hundred farms, there's not enough demand. If I can supply a hundred people a $20 basket every week for 50, you know, 50 weeks out of the year, you, you can do the math. That's a lot of money. Um, and a lot of it's cash. So I don't need to go into detail about that. Um, and it's scalable, you know, I, I plan on doing this until I get done teaching in eight years. I retire from teaching in eight years. And then, um, the day that I retire from teaching is the day I become a full-time farmer. And by then I'm hoping I can expand. I can find a new piece of land or I can buy my neighbor's land and, and expand it into a full acre. Um, but people can make a lot of money doing this and love doing it too. It's hard work. I mean, it's a hundred degrees. I got home this morning at about 1045. I got out there at 430, did my six hours of work, got home about 1045 and I was exhausted, dehydrated and exhausted because it was already, you know, extremely hot, but I loved every second that I was out there. Uh, it's, it's peaceful. It's quiet. It's just you. you know, it sounds pretty cheesy, but it's just you and your farm and you're in control. You don't have anyone telling you what to do or how to do it. Um, so, like I said before, if you have any uh, ambition, questions, no, no judgment on it, if they're silly or not, or just please hit me up, uh, shoot me a text, uh, call me, email me. I really would like to push younger people, you know, coming out of college, coming out of a two-year degree, coming out of high school. I can teach you everything you need to know in six months. And people always say, well, what about land? you don't need a lot of land you know we're not in new york city we're in we're in the dallas area and there's open spots of land everywhere you know churches own three acres nowadays uh one of my former interns is farming on a church lot right next to a church they gave it to her for free she's given them free food for their food pantry and she's got free land to farm on for as long as she wants to farm there's plenty of land out there uh, and i'll help you i know people um that would probably let you start farming on their land for free. So if you got a son, you got a nephew, you got a neighbor's friend, a friend next door uh, that likes gardening, show them this presentation, look those people up on YouTube that I told you and um, encourage them. Uh, I'm gonna end on this one, this one point. The average age of an American farmer is 66 years old. 
um, as you, and as you know, with COVID and now the war going on, um, our food supply is not in good shape right now. We got droughts all over, you know, California is in a 1200 year drought and everyone knows how much produce that we get from California. And Warren Buffett's famous for saying that the richest people in the world will be farmers one day. And I don't care about being rich, but it wouldn't be, it wouldn't hurt to be rich doing something you love. So I'm going to end on that. Uh, I think Faye said I have a couple of questions. So if you have any questions, please put them in the chat and I will do my best to answer them. Thank you so much, Michael. Yes, yes, you do have some questions. Um, fantastic presentation, by the way. Um, this is, I, I hope I hope this is inspiring people to actually get, I know it's inspiring me, so I hope this inspires everybody else um, to get started with this. So let's, let's jump into some questions. So the first question is, um, with farm to table being a trend, how do smaller farms, farmers like yourself compete with larger farmers? Actually, there's no competition um, that I know of. Uh, these farm to table table people restaurants or group of people that do that they want to buy from local farmers um the big farmers they don't want to deal with those small orders you know they don't want to deal with uh 20 pounds of tomatoes and 30 pounds of salad mix like that's nothing to them it's not worth their time to uh package that up and go sell it for a few hundred dollars um when they're selling thousands of dollars of orders to Whole Foods or to a, one restaurant. I have people contact me all the time, want me to do farm to table stuff. And I don't do it. Um, I just, I don't have the capacity, the energy, the time. I don't, I, I just can't do it. Uh, when I retire and I can do this full time, absolutely I'm gonna do it. But uh, there's just, there's not enough hours in the day with me teaching full time to be able to, to run that kind of operation. That, that I don't think I mentioned it, but I do um, my, most of my sales, well, all of my sales currently are going straight to families. So it's straight to direct to consumer. I sell, like I said, $20 baskets. Sometimes they're 15. They're about to be 15 because I'm starting to lose some, some produce due to the heat. But um, I sell to about 80 families, uh, 80 families uh, every other week. So 40 families a week. I can possibly sell to when, when crops are going good and I love it. You know, I get to know my customers. I had a lady tell me a few uh, months ago that her husband, I mean, not her husband, her daughter was getting married and she asked me if I'd cater her wedding. And I was blown away. Like that's, that's a huge honor. I was, I was very flattered that she asked and I said, well, just whoever's doing your food, just tell them to contact me and give me plenty of notice. So, um, but back to the question, farm to table, there's no, to me, there's there's no competition. Thank you, thank you. Um, next question is <clears throat> about your composting methods. Um, what materials do you use or not use? Um, and also, um, can you talk a little bit about organic pest control? So the composting question is easy. I don't do it. <clears throat> um, I don't have, like I said, it goes back to time. I just, I don't have the time to put into the compost and I have a great compost supplier from Ron's Organics there in Mesquite. The, the uh, nursery is literally two and a half miles from my farm and I buy so much of it, I get a pretty good deal on it. I load my pickup, I go down there, I get a pickup load, come back, do what I need to do with it and I'm done. Um, and to me, $25 for a load of compost is much more valuable uh, to me than the hours, um, I'm sorry, flip that around. The hours to me are more valuable than making my own compost. So that, and then uh, pest control, that's the hardest thing I deal with other than 105 degree heat. Uh, pest control, catch it early and always have a backup. So like right now the vine borers, squash vine borers are killing my zucchini. Uh, I'm still getting zucchini, but I also have another 30 new plants that I'm ready to transplant in about two weeks, 
because I knew this would happen. So I've always got transplants ready to go in the ground. Um, it's hard to, to tell people this, but the best thing you can do is bring in beneficials. So for every one pest that you consider a pest, there's 1,200 predators to that one pest. And I know that's an astronomical number, but it's, it's, it's true. So make you a flower garden. And I, I'm doing that, actually, that's what I worked on this morning was a couple of flower gardens. And I hate flowers, like I'm not a flower guy. But I understand that in order to get rid of the pest, I've got to bring in beneficial insects. The only way I can do that is to make some pollinating, it's called a pollinator garden. So when you go to build your garden, if you don't have a place to put a garden, buy you a couple of uh, bigger pots and plant you some, some pollinating uh, flowers like lantana. Lantana brings in a bunch. Um, salvia brings in a bunch of nice pollinators. I know that sounds like a cop out, but that's the best answer I can give you. Always have a backup and try, try a pollinating garden. Uh, pollinating garden. Awesome, thank you. All right, next question. So, um, can you talk about how you purchase the land and what, if any, permits um, you need to operate? So, there's no permits right now. Um, I'm sure the city of Dallas will pass something that'll make my life a pain. But as of right now, there's no permits required. The only thing that I have to have in order to sell is if I sell to a restaurant and then I have to have insurance or to a grocery store. So if I sell to a restaurant or a grocery store, I have to have insurance on the farm, which just says if anybody gets sick eating my food, the insurance covers the, you know, covers the patient. But I don't do that, so I don't have to worry about the insurance. Um, like I said, there's no, there's no red tape when you do small scale farming. Um, if I didn't do all of this, if I didn't do things like this, City of Dallas would probably never even know that I farmed, but I actually work pretty closely with the City of Dallas on my intern program and a couple other things. So right now, I don't have to worry. There's nothing I have to get as far as permitting goes to, you know, have a garden. And then, um, I'm sorry, what was the other half of the question? Yeah, just about um, how you acquired the land and uh, how much land did you do you need? So. How, how I acquired the land, uh, I'll make this really short. My grandma was the one that got me into gardening and I was five and me and her would do tomatoes and stuff during the summer. She died when I was 17. Um, she basically raised me, I was over there all the time. Uh, but when she died, she left me $7,500. And when she died, I never spent that money. So that was the down payment on my farm. Um, and then I just, I paid it off over the you know next few years. But um, I just literally drove around, found the internet, called a couple of realtors, told them what I was looking for. And they called me back and said, you know, this is for sale. And I went and looked at it. Not the best soil in the world, but sunlight was good. You know, east to west, I got plenty of sun. It's a good location to my house. And I bought it. I mean, it, it's pretty straightforward. There's a certain, certain things you want to look for when you buy land, but um, there's enough of it out there that you can definitely, I wouldn't buy, if I had to do it all over again, I wouldn't buy it. I would take my own advice and go find some empty land nobody's using and lease it or give them free produce or do something like that. But, you know, I'm not going to complain about having a half acre in Dallas. Interesting. Thank you. Uh, as a follow up to that, did you have to um, register um, half acre farms as a business? So I registered. I didn't have to, but I did. Uh, I have an LLC, and the main reason why I did it, and this goes for any business, is for your taxes. Um, on paper, I'm the worst business person on the face of the earth. Um, so which not going into too many details helps me on my taxes. So, and along with, you know, having a business, any type of business, there's certain things you can take off your, off your taxes, such as your cell phone. Uh, my office that I'm in now at my house that comes off my taxes, um, you know, gas, just, just stuff like that. But I, I would recommend any business get an LLC also because if something was to ever happen, you know, they can sue the LLC, you can file bankruptcy and start something else. If you don't have an LLC and something happens, they can sue you and take everything you own. So 
not legal advice, just what I was told and it made sense. So I always pass that along. Wonderful, thank you. Um, so we've got quite a few more questions. We'll try to get through all of them. Um, yeah, keep them coming. So, yeah, okay. <laughs> um, so what is your most requested item? Salad mix and tomatoes. And honestly, that's that's what I started with. My very first crop was salad mix. Um, and it's, it's easy to grow for the most part once you kind of figure out the bugs and the heat and you know, n nothing, I can sit and talk to you all day about growing salad, but until you do it once, like trying to do a weekly harvest every week, you, you don't get it. Like, it's just one of those things that experience is the only thing that helps you. But salad mix and then this is my first because everyone loves a good salad and good salad at the grocery store sucks. I mean, like, it's just awful, especially when you've had fresh salad and you go back to the grocery store that it, it's it's just not the same and then of course um tomatoes if you're gonna eat salads you gotta have cherry tomatoes so those are the two and those are my two biggest sellers thank you um next question um do you do any type of companion planting um and then uh, she also added it uh, she's guessing it may not be necessary in a tunnel um Companion, see, I, I kind of compare companion planting and interplanting together. Uh, I know there's like the three sisters methods, which is corn, uh, green be or corn, peas, and uh, squash or cantaloupe or something. Um, if you get into the soil sciences, they they talk about more about just having more living root in the ground as opposed to exactly what you want to grow. Uh, certain things do grow better with certain things, but to me, if it fits, I put it in the ground. There's, there's no really, the only thing that I do, uh, pretty much religiously do is plant some sort of legume, green bean, black eyed pea, uh, something like that. Every few seed, every few rotations into my salad bed, because legumes take nitrogen out of the air and put it in the soil in the form of like nodules like little bitty BBs, like really, really small BBs. And then um, when I go to remove that legume crop, green beans, like right now, tomorrow I'm gonna be taking my green beans out because they burned up. Instead of pulling the root out of the ground, I will take uh, hedge clippers and I'll just go right down the row and cut them off at the ground, leave that soil not disturbed, leave all that nitrogen nodules in the ground, it will dissolve. And then in the fall, when I come back to do a uh, salad mix, I'm planting salad on top of that, uh, those green beans but roots, because those roots where I've started to dissolve, it'll be easy to plant. And then lettuce needs nitrogen. So lettuce will take the nitrogen from those nodules and um, it's free fertilizer basically. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, next question, um, do you donate any of your veggies to food banks or food pantries? Um, no, I don't for several reasons. Uh, one, I can't keep up with the amount of demand that I have now. And I'm, you know, I'm still trying to grow my business. Two, I don't have a food bank that I know of out in Forney in the mesquite area right off the top of my head that takes fresh that takes fresh stuff you know there's plenty of food banks that take canned goods but it's a little bit harder to find places that will take fresh because it's got to be given away so fast and the turnover rate has to be pretty quick so um i do not do that uh, at this moment now in the future i would love to but right now i'm just not able to Thank you. Um, so um, I know we've got kind of a business question. So how do you how did you build your social media following, and do you do your own marketing? Uh, yes, I do my own marketing. I do my own everything except taxes. Uh, I tell people I'm the janitor and the CEO of Dallas F Acre Farm. So um, social media. So if you don't know who he is. You should follow Gary V if you want to learn anything about marketing. Um, I could spend an hour talking about the way I market. And but my biggest thing that I think um, you know, I've got three thousand followers on Instagram, which isn't huge, but for a little half acre farm in Dallas, 
you know, I'm, I'm pretty happy with, with that number, um, is to document your story. And I think that's what I did uh, that people kind of caught on to. And I just talk. Like I'll do videos and I'll just talk and sometimes I cuss and sometimes, you know, it's a really bad day and I just lost all my salad mix to worms while I was sleeping and woke up the next day and it was all gone. And I post a minute video about it and show them and tell them what I should have done right and how it could have been prevented or, you know, whatever. And then I show the good things and, you know, every day I try to post something that involves the farm um, and try to teach people, you know, the things that I've learned, like, like all the, the, the videos that y'all saw on here, those come from my Instagram page uh, just to try to show people what to do. So when I post on Instagram, I try to document stuff. Like I said, instead of showing the good side of stuff, it's more like documenting my journey. Thank you. And I just want to add, I love Gary V as well. And I know his, his whole philosophy is, you know, what are you contributing to your audience instead of, you know, just selling something you have to contribute to them as well. And I think that's exactly what you're doing. Um, you know, your all of your posts when I was going through your Instagram, um, it like they actually help your audience versus just promoting your business. Good, good. Well, and I don't want to promote my business anymore because I can't keep up with the man. So, like, it just kills me when I, people call me it's like, hey, can I get some stuff? And I, I just tell them no, I don't have it. And it just, ugh, the business side of me just goes nuts. <laughs> Okay, um, so we have time for a few more questions. So um, what, uh, and we'll, we'll try to get through as many of these as we can. What crops are easiest to grow for this area? From May to uh, September, nothing is easy to grow because of the heat. The, you know, it's the weather that's the problem with Texas. Um, it, it, it just sucks. Uh, during the winter, we had whatever we called that ice storm. And then now we're dealing with a hundred degree heat for the next 70 days. Uh, the easiest thing to grow are the faster crops. Like radishes are super easy. If everyone ate radishes like they did tomatoes, I would be a multimillionaire tomorrow. Um, you know, root crops tend to be easier. So you got uh, beets and radishes are easy. The onions are relatively easy. Um, you know, tomatoes are easy if you don't have hornworms. Uh, they're pretty heat resistant. Uh, I'm not going to say salad is easy because the bugs can really, if you don't know what you're doing, salad on a commercial scale, you know, and you get fungus, you know, get some fungus or some root disease. That salad's not the easiest thing to grow commercially. But radishes, beets, onions, and tomatoes are probably the four easiest. Thank you. And um, uh, this next one, I think, would be good for people to hear wanting to start this. Um, how do you how do you figure your prices? How do you set your prices? That's a really good question, and it's a really hard answer to you know for a hard question to answer. I'll tell you what I do, and I don't know it it, it works for me. Salad mix is five dollars, and everything else is two fifty. Uh, my eggs are five dollars. Um, now. If I sold things individually, that might change, but I sell in fifteen or twenty dollar baskets. So yes, tomatoes are probably worth three fifty for the size the amount that I give them, but my radishes are probably only worth a dollar fifty. But if I do two fifty on everything, it averages out to a decent price. Um, and, and when I say two fifty, that for everything else, that's when I'm figuring up the basket. So. If I've got salad mix and five items, you know, that's seventeen fifty. Or if I got salad mix and four items, that's that's uh you know fifteen dollars. So it's I, I just try to make everything two fifty and then over give. Like I, I give them more than what they really should. So if I've got five radishes in a bunch, I usually give them seven. So that's that's really about it. I wish I could give you a better scientific or formula or something, but that's just the way it works at my farm. That's okay. Thank you. And I think we can get through two or three more questions. And uh, two of these kind of um, are uh, synonymous with each other. So are you hiring to help support your, um, your demand growth 
Um, and that kind of fits in with, with, are you trying to do this full time or are you okay with this being um, uh, something you do um, along with uh, teaching PE? So the second question first, um, no, I'm not trying to do this full time. I have eight years to retirement. And if you know anything about teachers in retirement, um, you have to work X a number of years to retire. And I would be a fool to quit teaching with eight years left and give up my retirement. So all I'm trying to do is make my farm as the most productive farm that I can to get it ready for, you know, June 1st of 2030. And June 1st of 2030, I become a full-time farmer. And I get my retirement from school and then I can farm full-time. Money won't be a problem. And, you know, so that that's the, the answer to that question. No, I'm not trying to do it full time. Now, if for some reason I had to quit teaching, like they quit making people take to making kids take PE and they fired me, I would be perfectly okay with going to farm full time uh, as long as they gave me my retirement. And then the other question: Am I hiring? Uh, no, uh, I don't. I'm not in a position to hire somebody because I can't guarantee them a paycheck because I can't guarantee my crops are going to make it all the time right now. Like I, I can't control 105 degree heat. I'm probably going to have to shut the farm down in probably another month or so because of the heat. Like I, it's going to be a hot summer and I'm just not in a position to uh, make it work in that kind of heat, which is fine. I need a break anyway. So I'm not hiring. And along with the hiring thing, I do do interns. Like I take interns in, they help me. And then I teach them how to do everything hands on. And then I help them get their, their farm started. My last intern, like I said, is farming there in South Dallas next to a church. She's got her own 130 foot tunnel and she's making money every day right now farming. So I'll take some interns and I will give you all the help you could ever possibly want or need. And I will push you and push you and push you to do your own thing. But as far as hiring, no, I'm, I'm not hiring anyone. Thank you. And so um, we'll end it off on um, one last question and I'll combine two of these so we, they can get there. The audience can get their answers. Um, so what is the name of the lettuce that you grow um, that you were referencing and how many chickens do you have? Because um, in that picture, um, it said that uh, I saw some eggs. Yep. How many chickens do you have? I have uh, 15 laying hens right now. And what is awesome is I am getting 20 quail uh, next week for here at the house. So I'm hoping the quail goes well because I want to really expand the quail uh, egg business. I don't know how many are familiar with the quail eggs, but um, I will have those soon. It's more of a self-sufficiency thing. Uh, I'm a little bit bigger guy, so I eat a lot of protein and protein's expensive and I love eggs. So I'll eat the quail eggs and sell all the, the chicken eggs to my customers that I can. So that's, I have 16 lane hens right now. And then the other question, remind me again, I'm sorry. Yeah, the name of the lettuce oh, that you grow. There's three types. There's Salanova, S-A-L-A-N-O-V-A. -A, and there's a lot of different varieties of that Salanova. If you want more information on that, on which varieties, exact varieties I grow, email me, call me, text me, whatever. And then there's also Mir, M-U-I-R, and then probably the best one, if you're just wanting a backyard garden one, is red Cherokee or Cherokee red. I don't remember which one, which which order it's in, but those th those are the three main ones that I grow. And if you want a summer green, red Russian kale does very well too. Just pick it when it's a little bit bigger than your thumb. Uh, it's very heat tolerant too. So I, I add that into my mixture just to give it a little bit of a different flavor from week to week. Awesome. Thank you. And I, and I want to squeeze in one more. I think we've got one more burning question and we was posted twice. So Antoine as a, uh, says, as a chemist, I must ask, what are your best strategies to balance the pH or soil chemistry that is best for your chief crop? Oh, goodness. You could have left that question <laughs> off. Um, so how do I put this? If my stuff grows, I don't look at it. Like, I don't even care. Um, I haven't ran into a pH problem yet because the compost that I get is already, is, is pretty balanced just because everything grows. 
Um, I don't know how familiar you are with worm castings, but there's a guy down in uh, Pleasantville, down by College Station, and he produces the most nutrient dense worm castings in America, if not the world, because the dude is a worm genius. And he's figured out the right combination to feed the worms, to get the best poop, to fertilize your plants. And for those of you that don't know what worm castings are, it's basically worm poop. But the awesome thing is it smells like dirt. Like you would never know it's poop unless somebody told you if you picked up a handful of it. It's the most beautiful, black, rich um, substance you've ever seen. And he has taken tests from all over America, from all these other worm farms, and he actually has them hanging on his wall, you know, and he shows everybody, these are my castings results next to all of these others. And they are by far the best. And I was lucky enough to get hooked up with him years ago. And that's what I use for 95% of my fertility. And I think that's why I don't have like a pH issue. I don't have a nitrogen um, deficiency or anything like that, Antoine. Um, the worm castings are so good that they just balance out everything. And I also do a ton of cover cropping, which I didn't talk about because that's a whole nother segment. So I think the cover cropping also keeps my, um, my soil in good shape along with the other strategies of no-till, keeping it always covered, keeping a root in the ground. All those strategies keep my soil very well balanced out. That's a great question. And I wish I had a scientific answer for you, but I don't. Thank you so much, Michael. I wish we could keep going, um, but that is all the time we have today. Um, thank you to the audience for joining us. Um, so thank you, Michael. This has been a fantastic presentation. Is there, um, oh, perfect. I was just gonna say, um, is there a way the audience can contact you? Um, you can find his contact information right there on um, his slide that's up. Um, so make sure you take a quick sc a screenshot and um, are you okay with people um, emailing you questions please. if they have any more? Perfect. Yes, please. Anything, <laughs> anything y'all want to come out? To, well, it looks so bad right now because of the heat. But like, if y'all want to come out one day, y'all are more than welcome to come out one morning before it gets hot. Questions, email me. Like I said, I'm a teacher, so I do nothing when I get home from the farm at, around lunch till I go to bed at nine o'clock. So um, I, I would love to talk about this all day long with everybody. So feel free to text or email me or hit me up on Instagram any, at any time. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, thank you to the audience for joining us today.